I'm the type that I can't stop doing drugs until my body just literally crashes. And it got to a scary point where I uh, I stayed up for seven days straight on meth, methamphetamines and cocaine and, and vodka. That was my thing. There was Tito's bottles all over my floor. And when you stay up that long, um, it's like trippier than any psychedelic I've ever done. Like I was... I was I was in my bed with one person just I kept telling her to kick everyone out and she kept having to be like Sam no one's here it's just us like I thought I was at a hotel on tour and there was a bunch of like people partying and I was like I just want everyone to leave get them <laughs> it was weird man thank you for tuning into the Mike Squires and Friends podcast you can support by subscribing on YouTube or downloading on your preferred podcast platform and definitely go do that because it helps us grow and I can have more incredible guests on the podcast the Mike Squires and Friends podcast is proudly sponsored by DistroKid looking to broaden your musical horizons as an artist discover DistroKid with its smooth and rewarding music distribution platform DistroKid offers unlimited uploads while ensuring artists retain 100% of their royalties and earnings. Join the community of over a million artists who trust DistroKid to distribute their music across major platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, and so many others. Having personally used DistroKid since 2018, I can attest to their superiority amongst distribution services. Collaborating with fellow artists has become effortless, especially with the ability to easily send splits of songs, streamlining the creative process. With the DistroKid app, accessing these benefits is now more convenient than ever. Safely sign up or log in with two-factor authentication, upload releases on the fly, monitor earnings, and withdraw funds from your distro kid bank stay updated on royalties through push notifications effortlessly share hyper follow links manage account details seamlessly and track streaming stats from spotify and apple additionally explore mixia for professional grade mastering DistroVid for music video distribution and instant share for secure file sharing with collaborators producers and more the distro kid app is available on both ios and android Download it today from the App Store or Google Play Store to revolutionize your music career. Visit distrokid.com slash VIP slash Mike Squires to get 30% off your first year membership. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Mike Squires and Friends. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine who... I'm actually unsure if we've met before today, but we have talked for a while. We have music together. <laughs> Sam LaChow, how are you doing, dude? What up, dude? Yeah, I don't think we actually have met, which is so weird. It feels like, we, yeah, I honestly don't know. <laughs> dude, internet friends, dude. Internet homies. I, but it's kind of weird, like, how, you know, the music industry works where it's like, you kind of feel like you know all these people because we run in similar circles. Yeah. I mean, the amount of mutuals we have is probably unlimited, too. You Crazy. know what I mean? We made a vi uh, video together for me, Watsky and I. Oh, yeah. You dude. and I have a song out, um, and we're about to have another song out. Let's or is go. That, dude. Is that a under wraps? No, we can, we, okay, we can cool. talk about it. We can talk <laughs> about it. But yeah, dude, how's Dev doing? Dev is so good. Oh, my God. He's my screensaver. Just. Oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Well, let's go, dude. Such a good boy. It's a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's the best. That's that's the hardest part for, of tour for sure is leaving Dev, um, and because he gets anxious when he sees me packing. So now I've, I have a whole like routine. Like I put give, uh, give him to my dad's spot. So while I'm packing, he doesn't really know, and then I just say, "I'll see you soon." You know. Yeah, it's funny though with Dev though because like every time I see you, like you've almost made a Dev as like kind of a part of your like everything when you post. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, because he's just such a huge part of my life. Two, because he's just such a good boy. <laughs> and, and also, he's cute. And I don't know. Um, I always do stuff like that, you know, whoever's in my circle. And him and I are hanging out all the time. I work from home, you know. That's fair, dude. I have a cat, JD, who never gets any never gets any press from me, dude. So <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get him on and start posting him more. But one thing I know about you is that you cried in Toys R Us as a kid. Oh my God, that is a good, that is wild. Yeah, I'm not even gonna ask how you knew that. Um, yeah, I'll tell that story. Fuck, is cursing okay? Well, oh yeah, cursing okay, fine. Cool. Cursing fine. So, um, <laughs> my God, that's that was a big learning lesson for my parents. I think, or parents in general, don't give kids a choice of what to get, <laughs> or at least nervous kids like me. I was a nervous anxious like very serious kid growing up all pictures of me i'm always kind of like <laughs> and they gave me my birthday present which was like bigger than any birthday present i'd ever gotten because i grew up we didn't have shit you know and they gave me 
a fifty dollar gift certificate to Toys R Us to get anything I wanted, and they were like, "We can go right now." And I was like, oh! "So we went." And cut to an hour later, I can't pick, and I'm in like an aisle just crying. Like, I'm sorry, I don't know what to get. <laughs> I couldn't decide on some shit. And then there's some people like my homeboy Skyler. I remember he got the same choice, and he opened the first page. He saw a Batman suit, and he went that. <laughs> Well, do you feel like you've gotten better at decision making? Um, maybe a little bit, but I definitely still prefer like restaurants with just one item. Like I go to a restaurant, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. What do you What do you make best? Like, give me that. You know, I'm not picky. I don't like. I don't need a bunch of choices. It stresses me out. Yeah, dude. I'm gonna take you through memory lane because the one thing that I really do enjoy about you though yeah. is that you have been posting content forever, dude. Yeah, and. It makes it easier for someone like me who's trying to, like, research a totally. you know, person. Can you tell me something that you learned from Mr. A. Sully? Mr. A. Sully. Um, I mean, rest in peace. He, um, I have him tatted right here. He, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about hustling. He was one of those dudes, maybe it's because he had an older brother, but he was one of those dudes that just, like, out the gate was a hustler. Like, mm. he, he had a his own apartment, like, right, like, in high school, you know, um, he was selling weed and shit, but, like, but he was, yeah, so I kind of learned about the grind a little bit from that, and how to kind of, um, not get high on your own supply back in my drug dealing days, and, like, have fun, but be professional about it, um, he also, man, we just had such good laughs together, and, that's a it was a crazy story how he died, but I'm not gonna tell that really for but um I was there. And he uh he was also the best fighter I've ever fought. I I fancied myself a good fighter in high school because 'cause I'm left handed. Yeah. <laughs> and um two seconds against him just slap boxing, I was like done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> he was just like a talented dude. I don't know. Yeah, but it seems like you were part of like a big collective of like artists when you were start yeah. When you started, dude. You know, so what, can you paint the picture of that sense of community for people? Yeah, so in the very beginning, I mean, I think it's natural that um, you start sort of with, you know, especially in high school and with a bunch of homies, you know, and then people start branching out. Like, my circle's way smaller now than it used to be. I think that's just part of growing up, you know. Um, but back in the day, it was, what what we did was kicking it. Um, usually at Sully's spot, he he made the money with the with the the weed and the hustling and shit. Um, I was a guy making music and including all my homies rapping. Sully was like one, the one dude who wouldn't rap, um, and that's kind of how yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Like it was hanging out meant um, we didn't know it was working at the time. To us, it was just. Uh, that was kicking it, making music, having fun. But then little did we know, like, that would become my career and, and a lot of other people in that collective. Yeah, but I noticed that you did a lot, even more than music, dude. I, If I remember correctly, oh, yeah. you directed a video for B Streets and Swag Camp. That is a, man, I, that's how I got my start. Um, basically, that's how I made my money before uh, my music sort of, at a certain point it started making s more sense to shoot my own videos, um, just because it was getting more traction. And but um, for a while, I was making a living shooting videos for just super hood dudes from the neighborhood I grew up in, you know. Um, and so I knew a lot of them, and I just uh, there's a lot of them that I looked up to, you know. They were like fucking hood legends, and um, yeah, B Streets was one of them. Crazy dude, but like such a such a, a sweet dude. And um, yeah, I was that little white guy running around. You know, with my camera, it's like being like, rap the words. Be serious, you'd be like, I forgot, I don't know my words. <laughs> That's mad. <laughs> it's funny because I have that in common with you because yeah, I well, kind of started with music videos too. And I also was the small white kid right around yeah. with the camera. There's a, my friend always reminds me of a story, but there was a video I shot when I was just starting where the artist like cocked a gun and pointed at the camera and everyone oh. like <laughs> froze on set. Like there's a clip somewhere of just like when he does it, like even people in the video are like, yo, we weren't, we weren't ready for <laughs> I that. I never had dude. someone cock a gun, but I remember when I was young, I didn't really know much about, I definitely had guns pointed at my camera. <laughs> Just and I was just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's mad funny, dude. I also did it. I, I uh, moved to New York for a bit, and I did. I t took a year of film school, but then immediately learned, like, I could 
l- learn way more just by doing, you know. Is, we that, were like, is that when you went to go work with Kilmer? It was around that time, yep, yep. Yeah, um, it was probably the same research, time, yeah, yeah <laughs> crazy. Um, How'd you end up connecting with Kilmer, and what'd you guys end up working on? So, oh man, good question. Um, but yeah, I was shooting videos for like Hood Dudes in Brooklyn, and that was what I was doing. But at the same time, I was working on my first album, Brand New Bike is what it's called. And it was my first solo project, so I must have been... It was right after high school, so, you know, 19, 20, 18, 19, 20, something like that. And um, I basically, I don't know how I, how I found him, probably friend through friends or whatever, and Kilmer had this tiny little apartment in um, downtown Manhattan, like, it was in, like, the projects, pretty much, and... Um, I would, I remember, God, I could never do this now. It was one of those things where, like, you look back at your young self, and it's like, God damn, I was grinding. <laughs> Sleeping on the floor type stuff. Yeah, and, like, in New York, just everything's a grind because, it, t- you know, you're taking these multiple trains to get all the way downtown. I was living in Washington Heights, way uptown Manhattan, having to go all the way downtown, and then it was it was the winter, I remember, so just trudging through the snow with my backpack to go, like, record one song, you know, at Kilmer's. Um, I don't know exactly how we met. Maybe yeah, it was just probably through like Facebook or some shit. And um, he recorded a whole bunch of my earlier songs. Um, and he was fun because he was also he was kind of like you, like he was filming, um, you know, engineering, producing, producing yeah. yeah, could kind of do it all. Um, and he he always talks about how I was the first person to ever. <laughs> Uh, bring a saxophone into a studio or like any instrument pretty much because he thought I was just gonna bring beats and rap you know but like my first album was so many and so I had yeah singers and people coming in with big ass horns and (laughs) it was funny it's really impressive like how much of your early career even to everything now has just been document like there literally can be a Sam LeChow documentary because of how documented everything is dude and was that a conscious choice that you made early on where you're like yo everything needs to be filmed no, not at all. Um, I think it. W- I was never thinking about the future, like I, um, at all. I was thinking about having, yeah, making fun sort of documentary style behind the scenes looks at the music we're making as a way to promote it, because I feel like people like that stuff, or at least I like it, you know. Yeah. And maybe memories for me. But I don't. But um. A lot of I, I've just always even in high school I was making videos so I have mm. a lot of like funny I have I made my high school senior video. <laughs> um, it's funny I also made my high school did you really senior video yeah so we we have uh, hood music videos in common and high school <laughs> senior video dude. Mine my high school senior video they 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 knew me as kind of I was I wasn't a bad kid but like like the teachers liked me you know I was charismatic and I I was a nice dude but like I also you know, got in trouble a lot. Um, and I asked them if I could make the senior video and they said, sure, but, um, we will, you know, sell it and you won't make anything from it. And I was like, fuck that. Try to make your own. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) I'm making one. And I made my own senior video. It had like motherfuckers drinking, smoking, cussing. That's Um, amazing, dude. You can still find it on, on my YouTube page. That's what I'm saying. It seems very well documented. (laughs) What was your, you know, decision to go solo, dude. So, yeah, I was in a group called Shankbone that started in sixth grade, and it was, like, obviously sort of a joke. Just me, like, every... We put we put out, like, five albums. They all had, like, 25 songs on them. <laughs> you know, they're sort of, like, mixtapes. Um, but then our last one, um, you can actually still find on Spotify. It's a little embarrassing. It's just the self-titled Shankbone album. Um, that one actually... Like got us traction in Seattle. That's when it became. I remember we played our first show, and I was so nervous, you know. And we were opening for somebody else who was kind of an established Seattle rapper. Mm. And um, I remember we got there, and he was sound checking, and it just sounded so professional. And like, and I was like, oh, "There's no way our beats are gonna sound that loud." You know what I mean? Like, it just seemed. I just. I felt. I don't know if it's imposter syndrome or what. But then we go on stage before him, and the whole crowd. They're all high school kids from our high school and different high schools. We had no idea they'd been listening to our shit, but they knew every word to every song. It was a crazy feeling. I was going to ask you how that felt. You know, was that like one of your first moments where you're like, oh, like, it seems like you had a couple oh shit moments for your, like, in your career. Like, yeah, it was sort of a, um, okay, I always kind of 
felt like this was special, like we tapped into something, you know, even if it's just that sort of friends goofing around vibe, you know, like, um, but, but that moment was when I was like, oh yeah, it is, there is something, I am good at something. I'm not, I can't play instruments for shit. I can't sing, can't, you know, but like, I'm good at creating songs that people resonate with. Um, and I think it was kind of that point that I was like, I enjoy the shit out of this. Mm. So when I, when we all went our separate ways, um, I kept going. And then I remember it was some kid in class in high school that was like, yo, you're lucky that your name already sounds like a cool name, Sam LaChow. And I was like, no, d-. but that, that, I didn't think it did, but, um, I still don't really. It definitely <laughs> but, does, dude. <laughs> but that kid, I, f- I wish I remembered his name, um, it it helped me when a, a manager approached me in New York wanting to manage me, mm. and um, I was like, okay, I'll do the Sam Lachow solo thing, and yeah. yeah, I feel like you do have a very recognizable name because I know that when I'm talking with people, if they don't directly know a song right away, they're like, that name sounds so yeah. familiar, dude. So you know, let's move it down the timeline a little bit. As Sam Lachow, dude, what's like one of the first big moments of success you see? Uh, I mean, it is kind of a blur. Um, I remember the first time, my first album, Brand New Bike, it had this song called um, Gary Payton, Dubs on Deck. It was like dub, it was like Gary Payton, Dubs on Deck, you know, one of those things. Because yeah. we don't even, yeah. And that song sort of like barely, but blew up in Seattle, um, like a little bit. And we did a show at a pretty poppin' venue um, and there was a line down the block and it, we just did not expect, I, I didn't expect that. And it was like, but because of Shankbone having, we played a lot of successful shows. It almost felt a little normalized to mm. me, which I kind of wish I was able to enjoy it more. It was sort of like, all right, this is what we do now, you know? And like a bunch of taking pictures with a bunch of people, like it was, it was weird. And then it just kind of became a thing. I don't know. Like, cause my, our fan, I was, you know, super fucking young. Yeah. So our fan bases were super young and they were like kids. I don't know. They thought we were more famous than we were. Um, and then, yeah. And then maybe like playing a big festival and you know, when you play that first festival show, that's like, you can't see the end of the crowd. The crowd yeah. yeah dude. Those are, that's the moment where the show's almost, you're almost less nervous cause it's just so surreal and like, what is going on? <laughs> I want to talk to you about your 80 bar series too, because yeah. I feel like when you started posting those, you kind of took the internet by storm, dude. And I feel like I just remember seeing those videos everywhere and they like wouldn't escape my feed no matter oh, really? what, dude. Oh, yeah, dude. Man, like, that's dope. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I definitely saw them. And I mean, they have like millions of views yeah, like, yeah. at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got a lot I could say about that. One, there's a new one coming out. Let's um, go, dude. Yeah, I think I'm going to put it out. I think I'm going to start. Uh, I. The song's done, the video is all shot. Um, I'm probably gonna edit some of it tonight. So whenever I finish it, but it'll come out during this tour, and it has to because part of it I say, I'm on tour, baby, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's 80 Vars Part 7. But yeah, that, um, I don't, I didn't have any idea how, what that was, that it was like on people's feeds and shit like that. Um, which is kind of the story of my whole career, like me just kind of being clueless, making shit. Like I probably could have, hopped on a lot of other things. I remember I got a tweet from someone, Tyler Dops. He he ended he made he I don't know if you know him, but he I makes I do know Tyler. Yeah. yeah, he makes a lot of beats for like Macklemore and shit. And um and Travis Thompson, shout out. Um fucking I put out 80 bars part. All right, I'll start from the beginning if that's cool. Yeah, no, I want to hear the story, dude. So the first idea was I want to rap on beats I grew up with, like Ja Rule shit, Scarface My Block, like um you know, early 2000s, late 90s hip hop stuff that I've just loved listening to. And I was like, it'd be cool if I rapped on a bunch of them in one. And, you know, the raps were really, I wrote them really, wrote it really quick, filmed it really fast. And I just got a lot of response from it of like, this is so, t-. and I was like, oh, you think this is tight? I could do way better than that. <laughs> so that's when I did part two. And that's when. Um, the show started really selling after part two. And I remember um, Tyler Dops tweeting me, like, yo, you better have an album coming out right after this. And I was like, fuck, no, I, I don't have it. <laughs> was a, this was not a plan to, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any sort of trajectory for this. 
Um, but um, so then instead I just made like a part three, but none of it was, I probably could have planned it in a way that was like put them out right before the album or whatever. But um, and then part three and it kept kind of growing. But um, it, it was basically, yeah, just stringing together a bunch of my favorite beats that I've always wanted to rap on. Mm. And people are always telling me, why aren't they on Spotify? Why aren't they on Spotify? And to me, it's like, because they're not my fucking beats. <laughs> yeah, I'm no. not going to hit up, like, fucking Busta Rhymes and Scarface and, like... They're not clearing it anyways. Uh, yeah. Dude, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, like... It's funny, though, because I think people really enjoy those videos because they're beats that they recognize. Like, just the way that you love those beats and, like, mm -hmm. you want to rap on them, people are like, oh, these are all my favorite songs with kind of, like, a new flair to them. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I try to have a new flair. And I also try to use beats that you wouldn't expect to rap on. Like, on this new one, I got... I'll give a little away. I got a, that Crazy Town Butterfly song. Oh, incredible, <laughs> dude. Um... I'm not going to give away more than that, but I got some, like, like you, you won't expect it kind of shit. And then it's fun because a lot of them are, like, beats that I grew up with and, and are, like, hot. Mm. And some of the older generation will know them. Some of the younger generation won't. So it'll be brand new and fresh to them. And then they'll look in and find that song, you know. So I make sure to have a, I have a little playlist on my Spotify that's all of the actual songs because, you know. Yeah, one thing I really appreciate about you, dude, is that you edit a lot if not all your videos dude yeah um i i'm back to editing my videos fully i i used to like i would i remember the, my, one of my first videos that sort of did numbers called little man big city and it was shot in new york and i shot it and edited it myself like i just would place the camera get and i would have my little brother be like am i in focus but put the auto focus on whatever um and, like, you know, you can do a lot on your own, as you know. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's kind of important for people to hear this because, you know, like, you talk about, like, treading through the snow in New York City to get go to the studio. Like, to me, that makes the difference of you being able to do this as a career versus, you know, you kind of fall into the shadows that you're willing to put in the work and do whatever it takes to get it done. Yeah, and I think that me... Editing my own videos and also making my own beats for the most part, and, and I collaborate with a ton of people, gives is what makes me have my own sound. It, or, mm. And that's something I always recommend to people is, um, you know, with the, with the tech we have now, like learn learn a program. Um, you don't have to get great at piano. You can to learn how to make a bass line, you know? Yeah. You can do things like splice now to say, but the fact that, yeah, making my own beats, a lot of people think I just rap. Um, but I, for me, it's always been producing first um, and the songwriting second. And you don't have to wait on anybody, dude, which like, oh, yeah. Waiting on people can be the death of your career, dude, oh my because. God. You know, part of it is, like, things being timely. You know, if you had to wait on every single thing, like, sometimes what you need to do needs to happen right now. And, like, for example, like, the 80 bars that you're about to drop lands on you to get it done and get it out. But, yeah. like, you know what I mean? If you wanted to, you could edit it tonight and get it out tonight if you wanted to. You know what I mean? Totally. You probably would want it. But I'm just saying you have the freedom to, like. Yeah, and that makes me think of, like, there's it's such a thing that you can, you maybe you'll make a, You'll be an uh, upcoming rapper, singer, whatever, and you make a fire ass song, or if you're lucky, EP with a dope ass producer. Mm. Um, but now that producer moves to New York and has and gets signed to fucking Sony or whatever, and now doesn't have time for you. And now your whole sound that maybe it did it gained some traction is reliant on that producer. Mm. And now you're like. What I, I got to find another one of them. Like now they're a cool guy in me, and they're not hitting me back, you know. <laughs> and that can be, you know. And I've worked with producers and that have like ended up having to go on to artists that are under the label and stuff like that. But um, I never have to worry. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make my own. Do it myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna bring it back to some of your early touring yeah. days, dude. You stayed at Big Dawg's TV house. Oh my god, that's a great. Yeah, man, that's crazy. Um, yeah, it wasn't a house. He this was before, yeah. So we were on tour, and it was one of those tours where we were crashing with fans, um, like tweeting out like anyone in 
Uh, he lived in Arizona, I think. He does. He that, still does? Yeah, so I met him. He came out to one of the shows that we did. I think he came out to one of the Webby shows, so I, I had the uh, mm. opportunity to meet him. But I was, like, watching one of your vlogs the other day or something you were talking about. I was like, oh, this would be cool to bring up and tell the Hell story. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't think I've ever really told that story. Like, in a, like yeah, so we were, we were sleeping on fans' floors and couches and shit and just trying to save as much money as we could. Um, yeah, because we were basically, I think we were touring out of our car. And we were. That sounds about right for an early tour. Dude. Yeah, I think it was my first <laughs> tour, maybe. Um, and we went to the, and these two fans. Um, this dude, Chris, and um, this dude, uh, he called himself Dawes, and big guy. And they were just big fans of the music and stuff. They like knew. What, they were like, "This is crazy that you're." And we're and they were like, they had all these kind of weird like masks and like. We were like, what do you guys do? They're like, well, we do prank videos. And I got to be honest, no offense to him at all, but at the time I was like, everyone's doing prank videos. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know how serious. I didn't think all that much of it. And it was the beginning, so they, I, I think their prank videos were like putting on an old man mask and being like, <laughs> <laughs> you but I didn't start know how, somewhere. Yeah. No, exactly. But I just didn't. I, it wasn't that I didn't believe, and it was that I didn't know Dawes's hustle, his uh, work ethic. Yeah. Because oh man, yeah, he. Um, yeah, crazy. Him and I are still in touch today. Um, he'll I, come to my shows and shit. He's he's the fucking best. I Nicest will say, dude. work ethic will take you further than a lot of other stuff, dude. Like, just being able to outwork somebody. I think outshines talent. I think you got to be talented in some capacity, but if you're more consistent and just constantly there, you'll probably end up in a better spot. Uh, yeah, I've, I've always had a belief that if you're if you just stick with something for long enough, and believe in yourself and that you will find it's inevitable almost that you'll find some it might not be your first you know um choice career choice but it might be something behind the scenes of that or you know you'll it, so it'll happen you'll you know? never know like the thing is and the thing that you think you want might not be the thing you actually want because yep. you know you just got to keep going because opportunities present themselves and I know even last week, like, I wasn't in a panic, but last week I, I'm mo in the middle of moving, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, oh, my God, how am I going to get it? And I was like, oh, my God, I'm just not going to be able to get this all done. And then kind of within 24 hours of, like, my panic, everything kind of resolved itself. So sometimes yeah. you just got to let the universe do its thing because, you know, if you think about everything bad that you have ever been through, you've made through it. You've made it through it, and you're here now. You know what I mean? Oh, my God, yeah. And, yeah, me me – being an alcoholic, I can't let things like, I can't panic. I can't stress over things that are out of my control or I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I go into a spiral of self-destruction and shit so that I li have to live that way. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that too because, you know, one thing I noticed is that you're very vocal about, you know, what you've been through. Um, yeah, I think part of it is because it helps... Um, it's mainly, I'm ma mainly vocal about it because I find it, it's crazy how much it helps other people. Mm. Um, videos online on YouTube of people talking about their struggles with that helped me a ton. Mm. So I'm not, I, I kind of dabbled in like making, looking at the camera videos, talking about, you know, my, my story and my struggles. But it just wasn't really for me, and it felt a little performative. Like I, I but I'm always down to talk about it on, in these kind of platforms, talking to someone. Um, and in my music, I'm super open about it. But it, I, it's not something that I could just gloss over and like pretend it wasn't there, because it's mm. a huge part of who I am, my story, and my everyday life. Um, you know, it's here right now. Like I'm a little anxious right now, doing something like this, and. Where my addict brain goes is Papa Xanax. Uh, fucking ask you if you have liquor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like I used to not be able. I'm much better now. Like I feel I feel comfortable, partly because I know you and shit. But like, there was a time where I could not do something like this without being drunk. You know. What made? What was the thing that changed that made it so you could? Um, desperation at first. So like it. I also getting older, so 
my whole life was I, I woke up, started drinking um, when I got, but I, I'm, a, I'm a workaholic too. So that's why people were always seeing me like party my ass off in Capitol Hill, Seattle. And they'd always be like, how are you always putting out, how are you getting work done? <laughs> and it's because I would invite people to my crib, like after the bars close. Um, and, but specifically invite like rappers. I mean, cause that's who I kicked it with anyway, musicians and shit. And, um, I had a big crib at the time I, that I shared with a couple of other guys and we would, and I had a little mic set up and stuff and we would just, uh, do blow all night, drink all night. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've told this before, but just like, if we needed it, we'd be making a beat and we needed a guitar lick on something, we'd look around on like the couches of people passed out and be like, Who oh there's Brian. Brian plays guitar and we'd go up with a little spoon and be like, Wake up, wake up and he'd go, All right, yeah, what do you need? I got you, I got you, let's do it. <laughs> it was a crazy life. Um and back then when you're young, there's there's some about being young and you can like do that and then the next day not feel like shit and like like, I've played shows off two days of no sleep and, like, pulled it off, you know? I can't imagine doing anything off of two days of no yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah. Now I um, I couldn't do it. I would uh, I would do it because I'm a show must go on guy, but I wouldn't want to. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I, I really enjoy, though, about you, though, is that you're, you prioritize your mental health. Like, you're, a lot of people will just keep hammering the nail of their music career. But I know that you've taken, like, breathers when you felt like you needed one. Yeah, and, like, I'm sure you've had this, those negative voices, those, what is the point of this? What, like, why, why am I making my little rap songs? Like, who, who gives up? like, who cares? Um, and meanwhile, I'm making a living doing what I love. But that gets blocked out, and the negativity, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you can call it depression, whatever. Um, fear, it's just fear of failure, fear of looking stupid, fear of whatever, um, that has multiple times prevented me from continuing, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I should just get a job where I'm just, where I don't have to put myself out there and, like, risk looking dumb. You know, it's it's a scary thing we do, sort of. It is, dude. I mean, you're welcoming pretty much all judgment in, you know what oh, I mean? Man, yeah. And, like, I've gotten better at dealing with it to the point where, you know, I don't care as much. Like, I can just... At the end of the day, like, this is just, I, this is the life I've committed to. This yeah. is who I am. I'm just going to rock as Mike Squires because that's all I know and all I can do. But No, I, re I relate to you a lot in that. You've been just going, going, like. Yeah, but, I mean, to talk about it, dude, I had an incredible low moment earlier this year, dude, mm -hmm. which is, like, for me in recent times is not something I, like, you know, really i've been i feel like i like on a winning streak feeling great and then i hit this yeah. low moment where i'm just like yeah you seem like a happy guy yeah but, for yeah. the most part dude yeah. i mean like i over time i've gotten way happier and i've yeah, like yeah. learned to what makes me happy and the yeah. things that bring me joy and what i don't like but i think one of the big things in short was like my environment was like really really like starting to bring me down and my new thing is like it's okay to have those low moments mm -hmm but you can't stay in those low moments. You know, give yourself the time to, like, feel and go through what you need to, mm -hmm. but know that, like, this is not the world that you're going to be living in. Like, you can feel your feelings, process what you're going to do, but when you're in those low moments, those are the times I feel like you need to make a change. Interesting. Because for me, I feel like, I, I guess it's different, though, but you, when you say environment, you're talking about, like, your physical environment. Like, I was talking like about my physical environment. Location. Like, yeah. What yeah, are you yeah. thinking, dude? Uh, for me, it's, it's you got to change your perspective cause, and learn, learn how to be okay in any situation because, like, I have tools that, you know, if I was fucking in solitary confinement, I could, I could, I could meditate and find some peace. Mm -hmm. Like, um... And any for an addict alcoholic, anywhere I move to, my fucking addict brain s follows, you mm -hmm. know? So when people tell me, like, move from the place with all your triggers, I'm going to find new triggers. Drugs are everywhere, you know? Um, and But I do, I do think that there is a lot of validity to that, to change in your... Yeah, and especially, like... Especially your group of people that you're around. That's if, huge, yeah. dude. I always say you're the people you hang around. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you got a homie who's a bum and he's your main homie, like, you're more likely to be a bum just straight off him being your homie. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, he could be a great dude. He could be the nicest dude. But, like, you know, some people just... 
Yeah, and like I, I found that I didn't do it on purpose, but when I, um, so for the record, I'm still struggling. I'm, I, I've been getting multiple days or months here and there as as I can, but um, I've had multiple relapses. It, it'll often start with like Adderall. Um, that leads me to at the end of the night to to come down from that shit. You got a drink. I have two drinks. I become a coke fiend. Then I'm the type that I can't stop doing drugs until my body just literally crashes. And it got to a scary point um, where I uh, I stayed up for seven days straight on meth, methamphetamines and cocaine and, and vodka. That was my thing. It was Tito's bottles all over my floor. And when you stay up that long, um, it's like trippier than any psychedelic I've ever done. Like I was... I was I was in my bed with one person just I kept telling her to kick everyone out and she kept having to be like Sam no one's here it's just us like I thought I was at a hotel on tour and there was a bunch of like people partying and I was like I just want everyone to leave get them <laughs> it was weird man but that's I could go on and on about that but what I was saying is basically just when I quit coke um the amount of people that I realized all we had in common was our love of cocaine. <laughs> mm. It became clear real quick. And no, I, I don't hate those people at all. Um, they're all good people, but we got nothing. We got no reason to kick it anymore. You know? Yeah. Do you find that it's hard to maintain certain relationships when you're going through those periods of your life? Yeah. Like it's, um, it's sad because there's a lot of people that I really do like a lot. But they're still in in thick active addiction, mm. um, and I just I can't. And it's also it's just, it's very annoying to be sober around someone who's on cocaine trying to talk your ear off. <laughs> but like there's and so I miss a lot of people because um, they, they were genuine friends. They really were, um, and are I consider them friends. Like we were friends before drugs. It wasn't just the drugs that brought us together. It was, you know, we fucking had the same sense of humor. We had great laughs together. Got it. But then, um, at least until they get their shit together, we can't really kick it. Yeah, dude. What's something that, I mean, have you had moments where you've been scared? Like, I mean, at certain points, you must have felt scared and, like, realized you needed a change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, I never expected to make it to my 30s. I, I didn't, I, I was, I've never been very good at thinking um, a day in advance, or like the next day, week, years in front of me. Like I, I kind of lived for the moment, I guess. Um, and then for a while, I was under the illusion that drugs and alcohol were making my art better. Mm. Um, because people would tell me, like I would, you know, stay up for three days in a row and, like, make a whole fucking EP, you know, or at least write it, like, and my manager who didn't know that I was, how unhealthy I was being, I'd be like, oh, I wrote it, I wrote to, uh, the whole thing last, uh, you know, and he was like, you wrote to all that already? So I was getting, what's the word, like, validation mm. for, for, um, how much work I was getting done on these stimulants because I was never, I'm lucky I was never an opiate guy, so I never had to really worry about like fentanyl and Percocet and shit like that. So I was never that fearful for like my life. Um, But it was, yeah, I thought that it was helping my life and career so much. And then it got scared because it was like, it became clear that it was not sustainable. So it was like, how am I going to make music without this shit? I don't know what I'm going to do. And that got scary, and that's when I put myself into rehab. Um, and then it mostly got scary for, like, I was I was being so selfish. Being an addict, you're, you're, you're so selfish because all you're thinking about is getting yourself, getting high. And you're not, you're, I'm not thinking about how much it's worrying my mom, you know. I'm not thinking about um, how shitty of a boyfriend I'm being. And, and even, I'm, and I'm, not only am I like being a dick to people, I'm also just not available for anyone when I'm in active addiction. Like I am not someone that you would call when you need help moving. You know, I'm not gonna make it to someone's thing that's at 9 a.m. the next day. You know, it's a fucking crapshoot. Maybe I'll make it to your wedding if I fucking happen to sleep for for two days beforehand. Like, it you never know. Um, and it's so being sober. The one of the best parts is just being reliable. Mm. 
I was going to say, though, you know, music is kind of a tricky career, too, because I just know from my experience being around, you know, there are opportunities everywhere. You yeah. know what I mean? So, you know, how do you balance, like, you know, when music, things pop up and, you know, you're on tour right now, you know what I mean? Like, something's bound to pop up. Yeah, so, um, and maybe this will help somebody. Fucking... One like beautiful thing I've learned is that it does take a little while if you've been making music drunk or on uppers for a long, long time. Once you get off them, it takes a while to feel naturally motivated, but it comes back mm. for a hundred percent. If you're if you're an artist, you know, like if and and uh, for me, it takes about at, at most three months so sometimes it's like three weeks um I'm, i remember one time in rehab which is four weeks um by week three i was writing again mm. and i was like oh shit and it was like i was, uh, it was so beautiful for me i was like this is i didn't think this would ever come back this kind of love of music and this creativity and then also um i thought i was better on stage drunk because i was i would rely on my drunken charisma you know and now i do something called rehearse <laughs> And I actually practice my shit and try, and and my show is so much better. And I actually, I, I find that I'm goofier and more entertaining and fun not on that shit. I think it's important to be present too, dude. You present, know? exactly. And I think you'll remembering end up con- the show and connecting with the audience too. You know what I mean? Because like, I think those moments, there's like, for me personally, like, there's a lot of joy in those moments where it's like, yo, do you remember the dude who had? the sneaker up in the air in Philly. You oh, know yeah, I mean? absolutely. Like, just like the little moments like that. But I want to talk to you a little bit about rehab because I, I watched a clip that you posted, and you said the first – you weren't able to write for really the first two weeks. Well, the first like week is like just sleeping because you – and detoxing, mm. getting the shit out of your system. Because um, like I went there and I was – you know, when I showed up to the door because I, I put myself in there. Um, like no one made me, it wasn't court mandated. I just, I I physically could not, um, do it myself. Um, I had a drug dealer living next door. It, it just, willpower was not doing it for me. I needed to be locked away with, you know? So, um, but the first week was basically just sleeping, detoxing, eating, trying to be healthy again. Week two, now you're able to like start like, you have a little more energy you can kind of start working out but still no creativity at least and then like yeah week three um i started i I finally started listening to music again and listening to beats i made you know you you go places and you with a bunch of beats and you have plans like i'm gonna write to all this shit when i'm there and it doesn't always work out like that tour especially i feel tour oh my god touring yeah. you think you're gonna get so much work done in your downtime by the end of the day you're just like asleep you're just like yo please let me sleep no, yeah any downtime you're like the last thing i want to do <laughs> is do is anything work. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah and you know i have uh you know i have friends and family who you know have struggled with substance abuse in the past and one thing i've just learned from them is i've been there and you know been supportive for them but a lot of the times they don't change until they want to change yeah because i know from like previous experience like you know i've had homies that have like hid bottles when they said they were good you know what i mean like i've done that so they like you know they still find a way but what motivated you like what was the moment where you're like oh i need to change and like what made you want to do it well well one of the things that was just the fact that it stopped being fun Mm. it went it was a party for a long time um and the drugs and alcohol and it it worked like I, I was partying I was getting work done it was fun and then then it turned into a, it became dark I was doing it all alone mm-hmm. um, it wasn't a party it was far from a party it was me in bed fucking just n- not eating just Tito's bottles and cocaine um, is this during quarantine quarantine made it a lot worse a lot worse um but it did start to get dark before then like it wasn't i wasn't going out i wasn't having fun i was sort of uh you know i would invite like people over to my crib Mm -hmm. and it would just be me and one other person for like days just uh tweaking out kind of 
Um, and then it got to a point where I couldn't only do a little. Um, I had I I only enjoyed doing it if it was enough, if it was too much. So I would. It's it's a weird thing with cocaine because it got. I wanted to tweak out. Like I wanted to do the biggest line possible first. And tweaking out is a miserable thing. You're paranoid. Um, you just want to come down. You're fucking. You can't be social at all. You're weird. You're fucking sweating. Um, your back's hurt. It's like not fun. And you're like, I'm never gonna do this again. And then the next day, you do, it's and you can't explain it. You're like, I guess it's an addiction. You know, mm. like I like tweaking. I like that misery of being in my own little weird world. Like. I don't know, but it was just so dark, and then um, it had to be, it kind of got to a point, I guess this is a good way to say it, is I was like, I would rather, because being sober is really fucking hard, too. Like, you are you can't block out your emotions with drugs and alcohol. You, you know, when you first get sober, you, you're you more sad than when you were fucked up. But, like, it got to a point where I would rather be sober and just sort of sad and uncomfortable for a bit than rather than fucked up on night three praying that I survived the night and just praying to be sober again. You know, like that mm-hmm. feeling is infinitely worse than the slight uncomfortability of early sobriety. What's something that you've learned on your journey, though, that might be helpful for somebody who, you know, might be going through a similar situation to you? Um, hmm. Everyone has their own journey, so it's tough with that. But with all I can really do is tell my story. I will say that um, it gets better. It just it just does. Um, also, it gets worse every time. Every time I relapse, it's the drugs work, don't work like they used to. Um, they affect you in a more negative way. It's 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 called progressive disease. Like. Um, and then also if you're, if you're an artist of any t- kind and you think that the drugs and alcohol are helping you, it's a lie. It's a myth. Like we all want to be, you know, Hemingway and fucking, um, Charles Bukowski, you know, they romanticize like the brooding artist at the bar that drink and write, you know, American classics. And I, you know, I looked up to those guys and, um, but now the guys I look up to are all the people that made it out of that and, mm. you know, didn't end up losing their children and being hate, you know, because it, it, I don't know. Um, and if nothing else, when you're when you're like that, you, you're not there for anyone yet. Like you are. You, yeah, you're not helping anybody and helping people is brings you can bring you more joy than anything else, I think. Yeah. And I think that like, I think that is really helpful because like, I know one of my personal choices for like being sober is because I have people that depend You're on sober? me. You're sober? Oh, completely. Dude. I didn't know that. Yeah, dude. Not like, so not, I'll, I'll tell you, yeah. so never, I've drank maybe 10 times in my life, dude. Smoked yeah. probably just about the same. But what people don't know, the reason why I'm sober is because I've seen what it can do. Like I've literally seen yeah. it ruin people's lives right in front of me and I just like you know it's scary you know so Mm -hmm. I may not have directly like been using but you know firsthand I've seen how it can destroy somebody and you know no yeah that's and and that actually makes a lot of sense with you (laughs) yeah dude I'm straight up scared dude well and and just for your confidence like it takes a while when you because I would I was an insecure person. I still am an insecure person and like a nervous person. So I use drugs and alcohol to feel confident and to be able, I would be able to put myself out there and, and I liked my music more. I thought I was better than I was, you know, shit like that. Um, but you have the confidence of someone of that without, without the need for those things. And for me, I get that confidence back after a few months and it's so great when that happens. Yeah. And, and you start not giving a fuck. Like, yeah. And I feel like, it's weird because I feel like, you know, when you're younger, you don't really like I feel like it is with an age thing, though, too, because yeah. the older you get, like I wasn't the confident that I am now that I was even like a couple years back. It's totally. You know what I mean? But it's like you kind of just like learn you learn more about yourself, and you know, like how 
the things you like, the things you don't like, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, mm-hmm. you know, and like those are things that you don't know necessarily early on too, you know? I know. Yeah, it kind of goes like that. Like in the beginning, when you're young, you're just having fun, confident as hell, at least for me, you know, you you and your friends are making music, like there's nothing to lose, you know, it doesn't really matter. Then you get to at a point, for me, it was kind of maybe my late 20s or something where I was kind of like, can I, is this sustainable? Is, is this a dumb, what am I doing with my life? Like, um, you know, now people younger than me are way more famous than me. And, mm. you know, is, is this a young man's game? And then now I'm at a point where I'm like, I want to do this shit forever. Yeah. I'm still getting better at this shit. Like, this is, I want to be the type of artist that um, changes, evolves, you know, forever. Yeah. It might not always be music, who knows, but. I've gotten more inspired recently, too, because, you know, as I'm getting older, too, I'm just like, because they do push it like it's a young man's game. Mm-hmm. But I see a lot of artists that are a lot older than both of us, mm-hmm. dude, and they're like just, I feel like just aren't hit their prime. Somebody who's really got me inspired recently is Jelly Roll, dude, because yeah. he's, I think he's 38, 39, and like, I feel like he is like just hitting his like moment of success. And even a couple years back, dude, like, I, so, he brought my homie Echo out on the road for yeah. a couple shows, and I'm like, was able to connect with him. And like, even from how much he's grown from then to now, is yeah. like, you know, he went from superstar to super duper star. Yeah, you know, so absolutely. It, also, um, who's the one? I'm not gonna remember his name. I think he was like a rhyme sayer dude. Um, is it Prof? Yeah, Prof is incredible. He's another dude. He like, inspired me, and yeah, like he made his biggest album. Like in his 40s, you know? That's what I'm saying, dude. Yeah. So, I mean, the point of, like, the music game, it stops when you do. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? So, and it's a lot, there is a lot of mental gymnastics you have to go through yeah. within music because it is a tough career, and it's, like, the the amount of self-motivation needed to have, it's the walking through the snow in New York, dude. Like, yep. most people won't do that to even go to their mailbox, let alone yeah, yeah, boost yeah. their entire career. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um... It's fun for me because I'm still getting so much better at, like, I'm learning new shit every day. Like, my goal for next year is to get good at the piano. You mm. know, right now I can I can figure out chords and uh, just enough to, like, make beats. But, you know, I want to practice an hour a day type of shit. And, um, and also get much better at logic. That's a program I use. Um, be even more self-sustainable. You know, keeping new things on the horizon keeps you going. You know what I mean? And, um... Yeah, and and getting older, I have more shit to talk about. I'm wiser. But I, I, you know, I listen to a lot of my old stuff, and I'm like, I did not know what life was. I did not know what brought me joy. I, you know, because I hit peaks like where I sold out the showbox in Seattle, where people were like, "You should be so happy," and I was miserable. Mm, why? Um, well, one of the reasons for showbox specifically is I didn't know that I was addicted to Xanax and I was withdrawing. Mm. And I had a thing where I didn't like to take drugs before get right before getting on stage, you know. Um, so I was just like a, a wreck, kind of, um, just feeling like shit. And then also, m- I was making the type of money that I didn't. It didn't feel real, sort of. Like for that show, I got like twelve thousand dollars. And um, sometimes when you get those, you get a little bit of like imposter syndrome. You're like, wow, did I really just do this? Yeah, and and like I would, uh, I was partying my ass. I didn't realize how much I was spending on drugs, alcohol, and I was, and like, just eating out every night and all, all the time, I don't know. Um, of course, there was fun moments, but I was, I don't know, I've had a lot more joy later in life that, that walk from walking my dog than I did from selling out the show box, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, sometimes the little things in life are really, like, what bring people joy, too, because, I mean, with walking your dog, no stress there. Selling out the show box, there's a lot of logistics, a lot of things, like a lot of moving parts. Like, yeah, and then a lot of hate pressure. too. And like, that's yeah. what I'm saying, dude. There's a lot, and especially in music, you kind of have to have that tough skin because you could be doing everything right, Sam. You could be like, listen, even the people that you view that are crushing it and doing it right are getting the craziest comments, dude. Oh yeah, no, and that, yeah, and I think about that a lot too with people that are like at a place I want to be. They they have someone that's at a place they want to be. Like, there's never... It's it's so hard for artists to be satisfied. Another like, step on the ladder, dude. Yeah, like, when I see two artists, like, beefing and really getting... Like, it's real, But they're huge. I'm like, 
do they just forget that they're making millions of dollars and like <laughs> that shit doesn't matter to them because what matters now is this competition. Yeah. And our, comparing yourself to others and all that that shit can no matter how successful you are, that shit can eat you, eat you alive, you know? Yeah, I want to talk to you about a couple instances in your music career, too, that one thing I know is that you opened up for the homie Ritz, dude. Oh, my God, yeah. What's something that you learned from opening up from Ritz? Um, or for Ritz, should I say? First of all, um, yeah, we did, we did 59 shows in 62 days. Which is, that's a strange music touring schedule if I've ever heard one. I dude. mean, yeah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, but yeah, um, it it was a lot, but it was fun as hell. The scariest part when you go on the tours like that is day one, because you're like, once we're in this van, we're not, we can't just go back. Like this, this is two months. Like, what if this sucks? What if Rich is a dick? You know, yeah, <laughs> he wasn't. Everyone was cool. Um, Got lucky there, I guess. Um, But, um, and the first show is so funny. The first show was the worst show. The first show, there is, I forget where it was, but it was at a place where if I said he'd probably be like, that would be a bad show. (laughs) Was it Indiana? Maybe. It was a really strange, strange music type crowd. So, I'm saying I'm saying it's Indiana, yeah. dude. <laughs> there was a guy in like the front row because I wasn't Ritz. That was just the whole show going like this. <laughs> Incredible, dude. And me and after I said John, my DJ and I were like, "Did you see the dude?" He's like, "Oh yeah, how could you not see the dude?" You're just like, dude, banana and, goo pie. And we're like, "Are you like... being funny?" <laughs> I know. <laughs> but then it taught me so much. I learned how to win over crowds, you know. Mm. Cause um, you get on stage and they they want nothing but Ritz or and they all have Tech Nine shirts and and Ritz was in a weird period where he was getting off strange music yeah so but he's still like there's strange music that just has like a fucking cult ass following it's crazy um, but then I started like I I got a good Ritz impression down and I would uh, do that on stage oh come on <laughs> we gotta hear it <laughs> uh, I'd be like I'd be like tell stories about the day before I'd be like. Man, I was uh, Ritz. Ritz and I kept talking about how we were gonna work out at the hotel uh, this morning. Like we we're gonna go on a little treadmill run together. And then I saw him this morning at the hotel. I was like, "Man, yo, we, we hit the gym." And he goes, "Fuck that shit, bitch." <laughs> <laughs> Dude, and I would always get the crowd to go on because now they know I'm a friend of his. Yeah. So now they like view me as a peer rather than some random guy. And also, you're really just missing the red hair and the glasses. You could have been Ritz right Fuck there. Fuck that shit, bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not funny, dude. You have Bruce like is a, my guy. Yeah, no, he's a really good dude. Um, do you have a memory from that tour that like really stands out that you're just like whether it was like good or like bad? The only ones that stand out, of course, are the bad shows. That's yeah. the ones like, <laughs> but the, they're the, the best if you can laugh about them after because oh man, you have to, dude. We still will reenact me and um, Wilson Luxurious John my. He's actually a uh, producer of Banana Goo Pie, but him and I are st- still very close friends. And um, he was DJing that whole tour. It was me and him, you know. And um, fucking, we were in Peoria, is it Peoria, Illinois. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I have never heard of Peoria, Illinois. Peoria. Um, yeah, and so neither neither had I. And I could not. So the show starts. Oh, and we get a... Um, a request by a fan begging us to play this song called Matilda, an old song that we hadn't played maybe ever. I don't know. And um, we were like, you know, we were kind of hitting our stride. We were like mid tour, having fun, changing the set every time, like switching up. We we're like, fuck it. Yeah, we'll add that song. Let's go. And um, I could not remember the name of the. Of, I cannot remember the name Peoria for the life of me. So I just kept having I can barely f- remember it now, so I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I was having to find ways to dodge. I'd be like, Peoria, make some noise. <laughs> Mumbling it or just dodging it all together. And then we had this section of our show. I have a song where I talk about, um, I don't like the Seattle police. I said, I don't like the Seattle police. And it's, kind of, it's a thing we do, but then we would switch it to whatever city we're in. I could not remember the fucking city, but I decided to just try. Oh, no. So I ended up saying, I don't like the pewdery police. I said, <laughs> it was the pewdery police. Too many syllables, first of all. Nowhere near the right name. <laughs> and then when it came time to do the uh, the Matilda song that was that we got requested, we're like, here we go. And John told me beforehand, he'll do the synth solo. He had a key tart. He was like, I'll try the synth solo. 
But if like I can't find the key or something, just I don't know. We'll figure it out. And he gets to the front of the stage and he goes, "It's his time for the solo. The beat's coming up." And he goes, "Bleep, bloop." <laughs> he just <laughs> tries two different keys. He's like, "Nope, nope." Looks at me and goes like that. So I'm like, "Fuck, <laughs> Piotry!" <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, dude. Bro, oh, man. I, I don't know if there's anything worse than. Calling the city its wrong name, dude. Oh my god! It's so, yeah, it's so hard to win the. Once you've done that, like you've really dug yourself a hole that you just like need. To, oh my god! Worse yeah. is when you're like in like Buffalo and you say like Rochester. Like somebody, I've never done that. That's, somehow, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that could be like a crazy one, but. uh yeah, no, you definitely want to make sure you get the city name. <laughs> yeah. But, and, yeah, and you want to, like, sometimes I'll rock a shirt. Uh, last night in Boston, I rocked a Boston college shirt just because we found it. It's like, a cool play it. to do, and I think it goes a long way. But we had to, I did, had to make sure and ask the sound guys, is there some reason that people, like, hate this school or something? I don't fucking know. They're like, no, maybe if it was Berkeley, I would say take it off. But, no, Boston college, you're good. <laughs> yeah, and it's sometimes, like, when I've been on tour, I'll ask them, like, you know, what's the thing to say here? Like what, you know, like yeah. one time in Ohio, I was like, yo, if I like, what's like a chant or something that'll like get them. And he's like, Oh, say O H. And he's like, they're all going to say I O. And I was like, are you sure? Cause I'm going to go up there and I'm going to do it. Sound guy. And uh, you know, I go up there and I'm like, O H. And then the whole crowd. They all did it. Yeah. 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 Shit like, like that is the best. Yeah. I'm like, thank God. Sound guy, dude. Yeah. You got to find out how not to say the name. They're like, <laughs> is San Fran cool? No. Sa- Don't we say that. San Fran. <laughs> but yeah. What's what about some Frisco? The, what's some of the best advice you've gotten in your music career? Oh, advice I've gotten. God, that's. Um. Let me think. I think some of the best advice I've gotten is that got me p- through writer's block. There is no such thing as writer's block. Mm. Um, sometimes you just have to write something shitty and let it be shitty until it isn't. It comes, you know. Um, your first draft isn't always going to be good. Sometimes you'll just all of a sudden be inspired. But sometimes if you just sit down, start writing just a really bad rap, you'll get in. It always comes. It always does. Um, even if it's, you can take a book, open a book, read a sentence, find a cool, a word that you like, you know, there's, there's so many ways to get past that. You can listen to the beat and just mumble and find a flow first. You know, that's, that's a lot of times what I'll do when I'm not feeling, I don't feel inspired to like write lyrics. I'll put the beat on and mumble, freestyle mumble until, uh. Until I kind of start figuring out what flow, I get yeah. the melody and the flow, and then some some words will pop in. I'll kind of figure out what it's about. You know, writer's block isn't really a thing in music, in my opinion, and it used to be for me, and now it's just it's not. I think that's great advice too, because you know I I do hear a lot of people talking about like writer's block and whatnot, but my strategy is exactly like I'll just get on there and mumble, dude, because sometimes yeah. it'll just like you know, come to you, you like your mumbles and then you'll like do the same mumble again. And it like, it's almost like uh, a ball of clay, you know yeah. what I mean? And the more you just keep mumbling the same thing, it like, oh, there's a word. Yeah. Oh, there's another word. Oh, there's the phrase. Oh, that's what this song is about. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So I think that is a good strategy. And I also drive um, and, w- and play the beat mm. and a lot of my shit comes out and then I'll have to w- like. Voice memo with your pinky as you're driving. Quick ass <laughs> voice memo. Yeah, hopefully hit a stoplight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but have it, but have it about. On the flip side, what's the worst advice you've ever gotten? Worst advice I've ever gotten. Um, I think <laughs> Leor Cohen told me to sign to a label. For people that don't know, head of YouTube Music three hundred too at the time. But he also like put um, yeah, but he also is just a like what is it Def Jam. Yeah, I mean, he's just an industry industry veteran. Yeah, I went to his Cohen. crib. He had a fucking, like, uh, koi pond in his living room. <laughs> his <laughs> shoes were off. He's, he's an interesting guy. Nice dude. Um, but, yeah, he was under that old mindset of, like, even if it's even even if they tell you to make music, the type of music you don't want to make, the only way to make it in this world is mm. um, signed. As, find, yeah, and um, I just... The fa- the only reason I have a career now is because I own all my music. Mm. The, um, I know a lot of people that their biggest album they don't own any of it, and now they're trying to like make new and um, 
so I don't know. Like I, I make I don't make a ton of money whatsoever. I make a I make a living, but um, I make more than a lot of signed artists I know because they get like fucking ten percent of their streaming money. And you own it, dude. Yeah. Yeah, and also just like growing that catalog, dude. You have like a massive catalog of like over a decade of music at yeah. this point. You know what I mean? So it's like that's really what you should be going for too, and just taking those bets on yourself. Yeah, I I agree. Because, yeah, no, it can be tricky. And I've had people offer to, like, buy my catalog. And to be honest with you, and people who are thinking about buying it can listen to this. I don't care. I will probably never take the deal. Yeah. But I always ask them what the offer is so that I can get, like, a gauge of, like, okay, you know, if shit hit the fan, I have a quick get out, like, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like I've been offered that a few times, too. Um the thing is, if they're offering that, it means the they've done the they've done the they've crunched the numbers, and they're getting the better deal. Like, oh, of course. Yeah. You know, I guess the only trade off is that, like, if you were in a major pinch, yeah. you'd have that money right now. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. sometimes I see people will take deals like that, and you know they'll have the the lump sum up front that they're able to invest and grow their career, but most of the time, like. Just figure it out. Own your catalog and just figure it out. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. like... Money comes and goes. Yeah, and I think it's all part of, like, legacy, too. You know what I mean? Where it's, like, it's way cooler to own your music than, like... I agree. <laughs> I, I just... I can't imagine having that, like... It would t- I'm, I'm... Resentment is a big part of um, something you have to get over when you're an alcoholic because people drink over resentment. Oh, that's one of the biggest... What is it called? Like, triggers or something? Yeah. Um, but, um... Fucking, I can't, it would take me a while to get over that resentment of, like, knowing someone owns my shit that I worked so hard on, and I, someone told me to sign that piece of paper that I shouldn't have signed. That would be a tough one, man. Yeah, and especially with music, because it's, like, such an emotional, like, those songs, like, yes, they're songs, but it's, like, I put my heart and soul into these songs, you know what I mean? That's my story, like... Nobody should own my story except for me. I know, and now this dude I don't even know, like up in Sony, dude, who yeah. has never met me, doesn't even know my last name. You know what I mean? And it's, I made the beat. I made the whole. You know, I, yeah, I fucking funded it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like you know, especially when you're putting in those like works because this is a two way thing where it's like a lot of money goes into having a career as an artist too. It's like we kind of talked about it briefly before the pod, but it's like you know, money comes in. It's like okay, good. Now we got to spend the money for to just make everything else happen. I know that's the th- that's the thing. Like when people, s- if I make a bunch of money on tour, people think I'm rich or something. I'm like no, that money goes right back into studio time on the next album, right back into videos, and, everything. And touring is just so expensive. Oh as yeah, it, it's like one of the most expensive things you can do as an artist. Bro, we be- we yeah, we didn't do the numbers really correctly, and we had to fucking negotiate for a rental car at the end because <laughs> we got like a. <laughs> credit card for Alaska miles or something and the limit was I don't know but um we're like okay what if we only did it for half of the tour and then <laughs> but you bring up a good point because I think there's a little bit of like you need to have like a little bit of hustle and finesse in you too to like make it as a career as an artist. and I'm not saying be like don't I'm not saying do shady business I'm saying like you know if your budget is this like I don't know you just got to negotiate. You got to like, listen, this is yeah. all I got to spend on this. I am willing to do this. Like, I'll do a promo video mm-hmm. for your guys' company. Like, just give me a little break. So you need to have that like, I don't know what it's going to cost, but like, let's just make it work. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, and that actually brings up some, one of the, one of the it wasn't a huge mistake in any means. Like, I, I got dope videos out of it. But when I had a bunch of money, like after the Ritz tour, I came out with a bunch of money because of how many shows it was. And um, the few days off too, like days off are expensive. Yeah, days off are expensive. So we had no days off. We, we had three days off in in two months, <laughs> um, and I was getting paid for every show. But then also, my fans were coming out to every show, so I was selling a lot of merch, and um, so I came out of that with a lot. So I spent, I was I was spending like f- four to six thousand dollars on music videos, mm. um, and they look amazing. Um, a lot of it was like for we were building shit, you know, but um, it has nothing. But it, it the more expensive the video doesn't mean it's going to 
do more views. Yeah, it's gonna. It, you don't know if it's gonna be a great investment or not. Um, and I could have. I could have made a lot more music videos for a lot less money. And um, so, and then, you know, I had one song get big that we didn't make a music video for because I didn't know it was gonna be the bigger one. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? You never know. Um, so now I I, I like to because I still love music videos, but I make them more just kind of about. Perform performance videos of me having fun, you know, goofy, simple. I, I edit them. They're very me, my own, and it, for not much money. Um, you know, it's I'm bad with money when I have too much of it. I'm good with money when I'm broke. <laughs> I'm, dude, I've been somebody who is good with money, but that doesn't mean all my choices are always turn out and work the way you want. You yeah. know what I mean? So when things like, you know, when I spend money on something that doesn't pan out, I just call, I chalk it up to the legacy play. I was like, yeah. all right, well, that's just part of my legacy yeah. now. That'll, <laughs> that'll never, I'll never see a return on investment on that. Yeah, yeah. But I like that it's out there and it's cool. You know what I mean? No, so absolutely. Like, and I'm sure that's how, like, even with those videos, dude, like, even if the song didn't hit, like, I think it all helps, like, build your brand. Like, it all yeah. does help at a bigger picture. I don't regret any of it. Um, I just wouldn't do it the same. Yeah, no, and that's the thing. Like, you have to adapt and, like, learn in music, too, because the game is... I mean, even from when you entered the game, like, it's so different now, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you were dropping music, like, it was really iTunes and album sales like that. Then we changed over to streaming, and now it's, like, singles and then short-form content. Yeah. But, you know... As I look through all of your content, because, I, dude, I was going everything preparing for this. I appreciate that. You're great at adapting, dude. Yeah. Like, you have an understanding where it's like, all right, I can't, like, just keep pushing the same thing that I've been doing because that didn't work. You know, only a fool will keep repeating the same thing and hoping totally. it'll work, you know? Totally, yeah. I'm good at adapting, but I'm also, I, it, when I, so, like, when TikTok and, and, um, those kind of things became the short form content and then like making little skits and yeah. whatever the fuck I you know I for like maybe a couple videos I tried to adapt to that a tiny bit and I quickly learned realized I wasn't having fun doing it it mm -hmm. just wasn't for me and no hate on the people that, that make skits to promote their songs or whatever but it just wasn't for me I felt I, I felt corny I felt I wasn't having fun um so, but I did like the idea of like making it more like a thirty second mini music video or something, or um like there's things I really like about and when it came when it went from albums to singles being important, that I struggled with at first, and then I thought of it differently instead of ruining the album experience, you're shining a light on more songs mm. on that album, you know what I mean, yeah, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with like a change of perspective, dude, yeah, and like. It, one thing with like adapting in music, you really just need to do it how it works for Sam LeChow, right? Because yeah. it's like if you don't like doing skits, don't do the skits, dude. Because like the thing yeah. is, yeah, and people can tell if you're having fun or not. Yeah, and it, like people can see right through it, dude. It's like it's not genuine. It's not mm -hmm. like, but that's the beautiful thing about being an artist is that there's not one single way to do this thing. You know what I mean? You can really find what works for you. And kind of just push the ball down that field, you know? And, yep, and in my opinion, at the end of the day, good music cuts through all of that bullshit. So, like, or at least for my career, that's just that's just how it is. Like, I'll um, promote the hell out of a, a song and do a video for it, and I think that's the single. And then uh, two years later, out of nowhere, some random song on that album that I didn't push gets on a playlist it's a crapshoot you know and now that song is like my my biggest song. It, like it just happened the other day with the most random song called, called albino rhino um <laughs> my my monthly listeners went up like sixty thousand, an extra sixty thousand. incredible though it, dude yeah but you just never know you know yeah and i think that goes back to like you just want to give yourself patience like or you got to be patient per se because you just never know when it, and you could be so close to your life changing. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's like, I'm sure everyone's seen the photo of the dude with the, the minor pick and he's like about to hit the diamonds, but then quits and walks away. You know what oh, I mean? It's yeah. like, <laughs> you could be so close, but I want to talk to you. I'm going to start bringing it to the end zone, but I want to talk to you about like one of your biggest like success moments, like the moment where you're like, this is the greatest thing that could have ever happened. Yeah, so, again, like, I, like, right now, when, when like, talking about the, the pick to the gold mine shit, like, 
I still have a fear of, I'm very grateful that I never got hugely successful, like hugely famous. If mm-hmm. I think I would have died, to be honest. If I had unlimited money, um, I think my ego would have exploded and I would have surrounded myself with people that didn't actually like me, but all, all, except for my successes. Um, I think I would have gotten into different, more, bigger and more and more drugs and just, um, you know, because I wouldn't have any responsibilities. I pe- people carry me from show to show. I could I, so someone like me. That's a that was a blessing I, um, that it, it never took off to a, a crazy point. Um, but as far as like, damn, I made it, like. Hmm. Again, I was sort of. It was always sort of a blur because I was always fucked up, and but I think it was probably when. It would be moments where it's always when I'm in a depression or something, comparing myself to someone bigger than me. And then somebody talks to me about how much they hate their job or something and how, you know, lucky I am to do what I love for a living. And, and it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm, it's more just like, oh, yeah, I got to practice, practice gratitude. Like, I got to be grateful for the little things. Um, and that's yeah, that's what brings me joy. I guess for me, I've just found that like having a huge viral moment um, or getting a huge chunk of money, it's a high that and that high has to come down Mm -hmm. for somebody like me, at least. Um, So it's the little things. Yeah. And I think there is like, especially when, you know, those big moments are great and all, but like they're not always sustainable. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, especially in music, dude. Like, I've had those moments where it's like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. wow. But then it's like, you know, you, you got to expect that it's not going to stay like that forever. Otherwise, you're kind of setting yourself up for disappointment. Exactly, man. Like, yeah, when I have even just little things like what I have a post do really well, um, I can't, I don't, I don't let that get me high because, you know, that, that used to be exhilarating. You know, it still, of course, is. You can't help it. But, um, you know, then maybe the next year you're going to post, put out a post and get fucking 100 likes or whatever it is. And, and you can't let now feel bad about yourself. <laughs> like, and the game is always changing. Like, these algorithms are always changing. Yeah. So it's like you kind of have to, like, detach a little bit from it. Like, obviously, you want to, like, see what's working, what's not. But simultaneously, like, getting caught up in the metrics sometimes could be more damaging to your career than helpful because Mm -hmm. sometimes it's just timing, dude. Like one of my biggest songs that I had come out was out for like probably like six months before it even started getting traction. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, I could have like sat there on day one or day week five and just been like, oh, this sucks. I'm not going to do this because it's not working out. But you just never know. And, you know, the song that could end up doing the thing for you could already exist dude it just needs to be shined in a different light like used in a different capacity yep and if you're enjoying yourself with it it's like why not why i don't know why not keep doing it because what are the what's the other option when people you know what do you the other option is qu- quit and curl up in a ball and not and not do what you like it's just it's silly like, people do it though dude, yeah i know, you know? no i've like, i've come close it's tough dude and like music is a tough career and like you know, I've definitely seen people, you know, quit and go to other jobs. And I don't really, ho- like, hold it against them because it is a tough career, dude. It is so tough to, like, make it in music. But I think once you're in it after a while, like, how long you've been in it, how long I've been, you kind of just, like, it'll work. You know what I mean? It'll yeah, yeah. pan out in some capacity. Maybe yeah. not exactly how I think, but it kind of goes back to what we were saying before. If you just keep going, the opportunities and... Totally, and I have no, no problem. Like, if if for whatever reason, I, I I would be doing this regardless. And I think you kind of have to have, you have to, to you dude. have to have that mindset. Like, you have to love it enough to even if it's not working out. You you know, if if I have to bartend um, on the nights, like I can't not think about my next project. I can't not think about music or videos or film. Like, I hope to make a film one day. Like, I have all these. It's just, it, it's it's part of me. Yeah, and what I'm getting from you, too, and I've, like, known this, but you're by any means necessary, dude, where it's like, this has to work because this, this is what we got. This is what we're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's less, though, that it has to work 
it's more that I am gonna do this because I love to. It's it's. I I was doing it for so long before I even considered it being what I was gonna do for you know I was in co- I went to college for communications I don't even know what that means <laughs> and dude. I was making music the whole time yeah I mean in your own way you were communicating dude with the world yeah I guess so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah dude you know speaking of communicating dude like what's your message to the world if there was something you want people to take away from you what would that be um in, in what context like. Uh, maybe I'll just say, in my opinion, um, don't compare yourself to others. Remember that everyone else, you have no idea what other people are going through. Everyone has their problems. Um, enjoy life. Enjoy what you're doing. The, the, the comparing yourself sucks all the enjoyment out of it. Um, Thief of joy, dude. Don't, yeah, don't do something because you, to get famous, don't, music isn't something that you should be doing to try to get viral or famous, um, it should be something you're doing because you like, you have a passion for it, um, and if that, you know, and I think if you, uh, yeah, a mix of passion and a mix of, uh, work ethic and just, and don't do cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, dude. And if people want to connect with you and find you, how could they? Uh, man, I'm uh, at Sam Lachow, S-A-M-L-A-C-H-O-W, and all the things. I just put out a new album called The Left-Handed Bandit. Let's go, It's dude. my favorite work. It's so fun. Um, produced all by me and my uh, collaborator, Antoine Vincent. He's great. Um, yeah, go check it out. I'm, and I'm on tour right now. I don't know when this will air, but uh, three weeks from now. Okay, I will still be on tour. Actually, let's go, dude. I, I don't know which part of it, but maybe I could expedite this for you too, so that like if people see it, they could find out that you're on tour. I'll try mm-hmm. to make that happen. I'll That'd switch, be cool. I'll switch things around. But Sam, thank you for coming on My the pod, God. dude. Thank you so much. <laughs> so good deal. to meet you. That was so fun, man. Yeah, let's go, Thanks dude. Thanks for having me.